bow together for a short word of prayer before we turn to God's Word. Dear Lord Jesus, we just want to thank you afresh this morning for just being able to gather together. Uh, we thank you. We were singing that little last line there, my Savior and my God. And it's wonderful that we can truly say this morning for those who know and love you that you are our Savior and that you are our God. We pray now, Lord, you'll bless us as we turn to your word. We thank you that your word is quick and powerful. We thank you it's a lamp unto our feet. It's a light unto our very path. And we just pray, Lord, you'll take your word this morning and you'll make it a help, you'll make it a blessing, and you'll make it a real challenge to our hearts and lives because we ask it in your lovely name. Amen. Amen. Folks, if you have your Bibles with you, I want you to turn with me to uh, Matthew 9. And I just want to look there really at verse uh, 36. And as I said, it's a bit unusual for me, but I just want to take one word out of that uh, this morning. And it is the word compassion. And, and I think sometimes in the, in, the, in the world we live in today, some of the things, and, and, and me included, because uh, some of you laugh at me speaking about compassion and, and, and talking about compassion, but we can learn to be very, very harsh and hard, can't we? Because we're living in a very harsh and we're living in a very hard world. And yet as we see the example of the Lord Jesus Christ here today, as he looked across the multitudes, and as we look at the scripture as a whole, we see that to be effective and to live out the Christian life, we need to have that compassion for those around us within our hearts and within our lives. A speaker once said, uh, the present day type of Christianity will never win the world for Christ. And sometimes that enables us to ask a question. I'll maybe repeat that. The present day Christianity or type of Christianity will never win the world for Christ. And I thought to myself when I was asking that question, well then, what is wrong or lacking in our present day Christianity? What's the problem with my Christianity, with your Christianity, that we can never win a lost world for Christ? Why doesn't our Christianity meet the need of the time? And what he went on to say and what he went on to preach, he's talked about just compassion. He said that true compassion within our hearts and lives has to be real within us and then has to be relevant as we shine it out to others around it. And one thing we can see there, and we'll read verse 36 again, and when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Now, the picture he was bringing here, and we, we see that picture, is just sheep. And in, in the Lord Jesus' day, remember, sheep never went anywhere without the shepherd. The shepherd was there. He was looking after them during the daytime and during the nighttime. 24 hours a day he was with them. He brought them into the fold at night. He put a bush across the gap and he slept there with them and looked after them. And during the day as they were out on the mountains and as they were out there, the shepherd went with them and he looked after them. He tended to them. He cared for them. But when the Lord Jesus Christ looked across, he looked across a multitude of people and he was moved with compassion. And he said, listen, they're the very same as sheep having no shepherd. And I think one of our greatest Lord's attributes in his ministry, in his entireless ministry, is the attribute of compassion. What does compassion really mean? If we look at the word compassion, it's taken from two Latin words which mean with and suffer. With and and suffer. So it literally means to suffer with another, to put yourself in their place, to suffer with another because of their misfortune, because of the calamity, because of what they are going through, and to enable you to feel another person's pain. And sometimes as we look around the world, a world has taken away that compassion and sometimes we're not able to feel, which we should be able to feel, the pain that the world is in today. The problems that the world has today. And folks, the only one who can solve that problem is the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus was moved with compassion as he looked across a world without him 
as he looked across a picture of sheep having no shepherd. We can also go to the little portion there in Psalm 23, which we all know, the Lord is my shepherd. Isn't that why David had that great relationship with God? And yet when Jesus was moved with compassion, he looked across a people and he saw people without any shepherd. He saw them without any hope. He saw them without anybody to look after them because they were looking in the wrong places and they were looking to the wrong people. And folks, we're living in a world today where there is tremendous need, isn't there? And we can go back to that old chorus or old hymn that many people sing, people need the Lord. And the only thing that will bring Christ to the people is that compassion that we need. You see, it's one thing to feel sympathy, isn't it? But it's a completely different thing to feel empathy. And many people say, oh, well, I pity them. But there's a big difference between pity and compassion. And folks, if you look up the word pity, it's a feeling of, of sympathy for someone in distress. But if you look up the word compassion, it's actually feeling their pain and longing to do something about it. And isn't that the challenge to the Christian today? Isn't that the challenge to the church today? That we feel for a people, but we want to do something about it. You know, we can see the needs, but folks, what are we doing for the needs of the people? The little parable or the little story that came into my mind was, was the parable of the Good Samaritan. Now, if you take the priest and the Levite, this was a Jew who'd fallen in hard times and was beaten. The priest and the Levite were, were Jews. They looked across at him, and, and, and you know, they, they had pity for him. They had sympathy for him. But what did they do? They walked away on the other side. The Samaritan who shouldn't have gone near him. The Samaritan who shouldn't have wanted to help him because the Samaritan, the Jews, they had nothing in common. As far as the Samaritan was, or the Jew was concerned, a Samaritan was the lowest class citizen that you could find in the pack and order. He was considered, in one of the commentaries I read there years ago, he was considered as low as a dog as far as they were concerned. But what did the Samaritan do? The Samaritan had compassion on him. And he went over and he tended to him. He put him on his donkey and he took him to the inn. And he nursed him there in the inn. And he said, listen, he gave the innkeeper money and he said, you take care of him. And if anything else is owed, I'll pay again when I come back. You see, which one showed true compassion for the person? And Jesus had compassion. And folks, that's the great challenge to you and me today, that we need to have compassion for those who are around. Want to look, first of all, at demonstrations of compassion from the Bible. And folks, it's just illustrations. I'm not going into reading a pile of Scripture here this morning. But I want to give you illustrations from Scripture and tell you where you can find them. There, there's Pharaoh's daughter. He had compassion on, 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 on baby Moses, didn't he? didn't she? The reality was there in Exodus chapter 2, there the, the, the Hebrew children were going to be put to death. And, and Moses' mother took him and she, she, she placed him in a basket and put him amongst the bulrushes. One of the commentaries I was reading says, I wonder did an angel come and pinch him so that he would cry? Now, with some children, you maybe don't have to pinch them to cry. They, they, they can do it rightly by themselves. But the reality was he began to cry. And we see the idea here that in verse 6 it says, Behold, the, the, the child or the baby wept. And it says about Pharaoh's daughter, she was moved with compassion. And she said, this is one of the Hebrew children. Now she knew that, that the Pharaoh had ordered them to be put to death. But she had compassion on him. She spared him. And when she heard that cry, she was moved. She was moved. And you see, sometimes, folks, when we hear the cry, when we hear the cry of those people who need to hear about the Lord, when we hear the cry about those in tremendous need in our land today, are we moved? Are we moved? 
I remember speaking to a man there a wee while ago at a funeral service. I was outside after the service, and he said, could you even picture as we look around today what Ukraine is going through? Thirteen days ago, it was thirteen days into the conflict, and they said everybody in Ukraine was going around doing exactly what we're doing. And now look at the country in ruins. He said, imagine if that came here. And he turned to me and he said, Doesn't, should that not move us? And the reality is, folks, it should. When we see the need, that need should move us. That's what compassion does. God had compassion on, on the oppressed Israelites. There in 2 Kings 13 and verses 22 and 23, it says, But Hezekiah, king of Syria, oppressed Israel all the days of Jehoiakim, And the Lord was gracious unto them, and he had compassion on them. You see, the children of Israel were going through a time of real oppression. But the Lord knew, and the Lord had compassion on them. And I think sometimes, you know, even for ourselves, you know, we can be going through times of real oppression and difficulty and trial and tribulation. And sometimes we look around and we, we can ask the question, does God really care? And I know and I've been in some of your homes and you've been going through very difficult times and you've asked that question to me. You know, it's always good to say God does care. But sometimes when we're down and we're oppressed, we maybe feel, does God care? Is he a compassionate God? Does anyone else care? Do they know what we're going through? Well, that's what true compassion is. We know God cares. And then we can come to the point we know other people care as well. When we're going through difficult times. The third little thought here is Jesus had compassion on the multitudes. He had compassion on the multitudes. And folks, I could give example after example of where Jesus had compassion. You know, we talk about the feeding of the 5,000, but there in Matthew 15, there's the feeding of the, of the 4,000. And they were hungry. They'd been following him three days, and they had nothing to eat. And there in verse 32, he said, I have compassion on the multitudes, simply because they were hungry. You know, we see people and we say, well, they have a need spiritually. But sometimes, folks, can I say, that need can be spiritual. If somebody's hungry, what we're supposed to do? Feed them. Isn't that right? If somebody needs clothing, what's the responsibility? Folks, we give them something to put on. That's the reality. And the reality for us, sometimes we miss the opportunity because we haven't the vision to see it. We haven't the vision to see it. We haven't the true compassion that we need. Matthew 9 and, and 36 says this, But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion. They fainted, were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. As sheep having no shepherd. Folks, we, we always need to keep that wee illustration in our mind. You see, we can visualize it, can't we? Sheep without a shepherd. Sheep being scattered. In those days, there was the wolves that would come in. In those days, there would have been the bears that would come in. We see of David with the slingshot, that's what he was out to do. He was out to protect the sheep. And folks, that's the challenge to us as, as a fellowship, as a church, as, as a pastor, is to protect the sheep. So many times the ravening wolves are coming in. And the compassion is not there for us to be moved to do something about it. In Matthew 14, there it says he was moved with compassion towards them and he healed their sick. You know, if you take time to look at all the Lord Jesus healed, all he fed, the majority of his ministry for those three years was, was healing people, was feeding people was dealing with the needs of individuals, physically and spiritually. And sometimes, folks, we tend to forget the physical. And sometimes we, we don't do what we should be doing regarding the spiritual either. 
That's the challenge because he was moved with compassion. And folks, the last little story here in this first part is the story of, of the return of the prodigal son. And I know you've probably heard many, many sermons on, on the story of the prodigal son, but the wonderful thought you have here is, is the father had compassion upon him, didn't he? The father wasn't sitting in there. I know if it was me, I'd be sitting in there and I'd be saying the words I told him so. Hands up who'd be saying that. The majority you would, wouldn't you? Ah, well, I told them. I told them. But the father wasn't. Folks, because he saw him a long way off. And he didn't stand at the front door and say, well, listen, look, I don't have compassion. I'll tell him when he comes to my front door and we'll have a good chat. But he didn't. And you see, men in those days of the standing here of, of the prodigal son father, they didn't run. But he didn't care who was, who was watching. He wasn't interested who was looking. He ran. And he didn't stand there and tell him so. He threw his arms around him. He threw his arms around him. And folks, he kissed him on the neck. Can you imagine a boy that probably hadn't washed for months? a boy who'd been feeding the pigs. Can you imagine the smell of that boy? The father didn't care, sure he didn't. Because he had compassion on his son. He didn't stand to say, listen, I've told you so. Because he had true compassion. And folks, that's the compassion that we need in these days, isn't it? Doesn't matter what people are like. I remember a number of years ago, a young fellow came to the door and he said something that blessed my heart. And he said to me, you know, he says, Mervyn, he says, no matter where you saw me, at least you spoke to me. At least you spoke to me. And he said to me this, and I'll never forget it. He said, at least you live out what you preach. And isn't that the challenge to us today? to simply live out what we preach and live out what we believe and show out that compassion to others around. Second little thought here, folks, is compassion is a wonderful emotion. Compassion's a wonderful emotion. You know, sometimes we forget what, what true compassion really is. And of all the emotions that pass through our very souls, the greatest is compassion. Why? Because it identifies us with the needs of others. It identifies us with the needs of others. You know, I've been to many prayer meetings over the years, and I've seen people coming in, and I've seen tears flow for loved ones. I've seen tears flow for, for neighbors. I've seen tears flow for, for friends and people to come in contact with. I spoke to a wee man years ago, and he turned to me, and he says, Mervyn, he says, I visit this woman every day, and my desire is to see her one for Christ. Every day. And he brought me in with her that day, and now he says, if you get the chance, you preach to her. As long as he didn't say preach at her, that was the main thing, wasn't it? But you preach to her. See, what was his desire? He desired to see that woman saved, because he saw the need. And the reality for you and me, compassion helps us to see that need. You know, after nearly coming up to 30 years in ministry, there's an old saying, no one knows what goes on under another man's table. And you know, I'm beginning to realize that more and more. As every week passes, as every year passes, you know, we're very quick to say, oh, well, I'm sure they have everything they want. There's no home that has everything they want. There's no home that doesn't have the difficulties or the problems. And there's no home that does not need compassion. What did compassion lead? We can go back on very quickly, much to say on it, but I won't this morning. Compassion led to the adoption of Moses into Pharaoh's daughter's house, didn't it? Moses was led on then to lead the children of Israel. When the red went to the Red Sea, didn't they walk across on dry ground? Because God took Moses and God wonderfully led him and used him. What was the compassion? The compassion that that young girl saw. 
led to God using a man that he could take and that he could use. You know, if we go into compassion led to the relief of the oppressed in Israel, God saw the oppression of the people. But God led them out of oppression. And God wonderfully blessed them. And folks, that's what God can do. No matter what difficulty somebody can do, there's always a way of escape, isn't there? There's always blessing at the end because after he has tried us, we shall come forth as gold. Where did it start with? It started with compassion. You know, compassion caused our Lord to, to feed the multitudes. I was touched there the other day when Keith Lindsay was speaking and, and, and he talked about this man and he said, you know, he'd, he'd money saved up for his retirement and for his pension and everything else. And he said, you know, it's not what you leave behind that counts. It's what you use for the Lord here and now. And he went to him after. He said, what does it cost to, to build that church? And Keith gave him the figure. I can't uh, me, me remember the exact figure. And wasn't it wonderful? He said, you know, it's building for eternity that counts. And the man wrote him a check there and then, and the church was built debt free. It's wonderful, isn't it? Wonderful what God can do. Compassion caused the Samaritan to help his enemy, the Jew. You know, folks, they say we shouldn't have any enemies or should nobody like, but you know, compassion helps us to love the unlovable, doesn't it? That's the reality. And compassion explains why a father welcomed back his son into the family fold. What did he do, folks? We could look at all these things. He kissed them, a sign of affection, a sign of reconciliation. He put the best robe. In other words, he put the robe that, that he originally had. We're dressed in the robe of righteousness. That's the idea behind it here. We haven't time to go into it. He gave them a ring, a mark of favor, a mark of affection, a mark of office. He was his son again. He, he put shoes on his feet. The only ones who didn't have shoes in those days were servants. He was no longer a servant. He said, make me as one of your hired servants. He said, no, you're not one of my hired servants. You're a son. You're a son. You're back into the family. And then he had a feast. He said, let's be joyful and be happy. My son who was dead. And I never realized until recently as I studied that little portion, do you know what happened to son when he came back? In some of the commentaries I read, they said, a son was stoned to death. It was as if he was dead as far as the family was concerned. He would have been stoned to death. And the father wasn't worried about any zone of stone. That's why he ran and put his arms around him. That's why he brought him back. That's why he showed him all those signs. And that's why he had his feast. Because now he is my son. That's what the outpouring of compassion can do. And very quickly, compassion is our supreme end. In other words, we need compassion. Folks, when does compassion come? If we look at all those instances, it was when Pharaoh's daughter saw the child. When she saw the child for herself. You might see whenever we see a child, we'll be moved, won't we? It moved her when she saw the child. When God saw the oppression of the people, he was moved with compassion. When Jesus saw the hungry souls, he was moved with compassion. When the Samaritan saw the wounded man, he was moved with compassion. And when the father saw the wayward son, he was moved with compassion. I wonder this morning, do we have eyes to see? You know, spiritually speaking, we can go around the world and we can go blindly around it, can't we? as far as our spiritual life and our spiritual existence and the spiritual need is concerned. One of the commentaries I was reading said, no compassion, no vision. And the scripture says, where there's no vision, the people perish. That's the challenge regarding compassion. The second little thought here, a lack of compassion is the explanation of, of an active Christianity. I thought, when I thought of this and I thought of that and I thought of writing it down, it's an unwillingness to do something for the Lord that we know we should be doing. And folks, there's something that you can do for the Lord 
whether here in the fellowship, whether further afield. And folks, that's why I'm given this little challenge this morning. Maybe there's an unwillingness to help, whether it's with the young people or whether it's with the Sunday school or, or whether it's with some other thing that you, you can be involved in. Maybe it's an unwillingness to, to, to do something. You know, one of the greatest ministries today, and sometimes uh, the, the problem is laid at our door as pastors and ministers, and this can be true. They say nobody visits today. Nobody visits today. And I don't know how many times that people have said to me, oh, you ministers, you don't visit anymore. And I say, well, I, 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 I kind of do. But you know, some people say I haven't time. Can I say, if you haven't time to visit, you need to make time. And can I give you a wee challenge this morning? Maybe there's nothing else you can do, but you know, you can go visit someone. Go knock on their door. If I was to ask you this morning, how many homes have I been sent away? Now, you know me gathering up in your door, you could be probably sent away right enough. But how many homes have I been told, you know, you're not allowed in and you're not allowed to come in? Can I say not one? Not one. Over all the years, people are glad when you come in because people are glad to talk. One thing challenged me a number of years ago was, was a man was preaching and he said somebody came in to have their hearing aid checked. And in the hearing aid, now I don't know whether you're going to clarify it or not, but the hearing aid goes off or something inside with some, maybe the older ones or that, and it tells you that your battery's nearly done and change your battery. Now, the man who was doing the hearing aid, he says, I'll turn that off for you because that won't be annoying you. And the wee woman said, you know, that's sometimes the only voice I hear during the week. Just leave it on. Just leave it on. It's not some challenge, isn't it? Just leave it on. And folks, can I say to you, visiting, I believe, is one of the greatest things you can do. And then what's the tremendous need today with this? I've spent too long. But there's an unwillingness sometimes to answer the call of God upon your life. You know, when I went to meetings when I was young, the challenge was always brought to us. Will you go? Will you do something for the Lord? I remember when I went to many of the conventions as, as a young lad, the challenge was always there. There's a need everywhere today. And we'll go down to the end here, and I'll finish with this. He saith unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous there in verse 37, but the labors are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send, or that he will thrust forth laborers into his harvest field. Will you pray that God will do that? Or sometimes the example is, would you go if the Lord called you to go? Amen. Folks, we're going to sing in closing. Thanks, Greg, Kathy Ann. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Tremendous little hymn. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Jesus, to you we lift our eyes. Jesus, our glory and our prize. We adore you, behold you, our Savior ever true. O oh, Jesus, we turn our eyes to you. Let's stand together and let's sing this through uh, from our hearts this morning, just in closing. Thanks. Thank you.
Dear Lord Jesus, we turn our eyes to you because your word tells us you're the author, you're the finisher, and you're the perfecter of our faith. May we in our Christian life and Christian example in these days have that true compassion as you left us an example that we should follow in your steps. We pray now, O oh Lord, you'll just part us with your blessing. Bring us to our homes in safety. And we do pray, Lord, throughout this coming week, Lord, just give us opportunities to witness for you, to speak a word for you. Lord, to live out our lives in a way that will honor, glorify, and magnify your wonderful name, because we ask it in your lovely name. Amen. Amen.